I'd like to thank the organisers uh, for inviting me here, and I'm, I'm particularly pleased uh, to be here. I'm, I'm pleased to be here, but I'm not pleased my, my bags failed uh, to make it with me. Um, hence, hence the Steve Jobs appearance, and I do promise I'm not going to talk about the latest innovation in the iPhone. Um, next time I check in, uh, I had the occasion of, of being at one of our collaborating universities in the UK, which is where I travel from, and next time I check in, to Heathrow to come to Brussels, I'm going to tell them that I want that bag to stay in Heathrow, I want that bag to stay in Amsterdam, and I'm just going to go to Brussels myself. <laughs> At which they'll say, we can't do that, sir, and I'll say, yes, you can. <laughs> okay, um, I'm basically going to kick off with a video that explains what the SNI is about, and this is my colleague Nick Smith uh, telling you all about it. Sustainable Nutrition Initiative, or SNI, provides clear evidence for the sustainable food system debate. We're hosted by the Riddit Institute, a New Zealand Centre of Research Excellence at Massey University. The SNI team has expertise in human nutrition, food technology, agriculture, data science and mathematical modelling. This expertise is used to design tools to help understand food systems, from global production and trade down to sustainable diets for individuals. For example, the Delta model is our online tool for understanding the sustainability of the global food system. It calculates what changes to things like food production, population and food waste will do for the nutrition of the global population. The model is used in academic and industry research, policy advice, and by students at our partner universities. The SNI team can help academics, the food industry, policymakers, and government departments to better understand food systems and human nutrition. On our website, you'll find examples of our outreach and collaborations. If you're interested in being involved, please get in touch. Really delighted to hear uh, last week that the European Commission has actually started to uh, have a look at using the model to uh, to gain some insights. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, um, my favourite uh, slide, and I'll give you a little bit of time to, because I, I, I'm going to be asking questions of the audience on this uh, a little later. Um, this is actually the global food system at a national level, right? Um, the bottom bit is about what happens across borders and trade and so on and so forth. So it's, it's phenomenally complex and touches just about every aspect of what we do. If there's one thing that we do ubiquitously across everybody in the world, it's, it's around food, it's around diets, etc. cetera. And, and for that matter, at least uh, food production of some form, in, uh, in every country. Now, it's impossible to model the whole system, and we haven't tried to do that. But as defined by uh, the uh, World Committee for Food Security, uh, food, sustainable food systems are those systems that ensure food security and nutrition for all, which is a foundation starting point. And, and our argument is, if you do not have the right amount of nutrients for everybody, and, and particularly the bioavailability that was Connie was talking about before, because it's not just the, the amount of nutrients, it's, it's bioavailable nutrients, um, then you really can't have a sustainable food system. But of course, it, it has to be sustainable economically, socially, and environmentally if we're going to have that system sustainable uh, long term and not just a sustainable food system but a sustainable world for that matter. Now we look at this at three scales, in fact we're developing three models and I'll start with the one what should I eat. So essentially this says as an individual, as a family, I can purchase and consume food, what do I choose? What are the consequences of those choices in terms of the nutrition? What are the consequences of those choices in terms of the things that are around the nutrition, the footprint, the water, the greenhouse gas, the price of the diet, et cetera? Um, we've already done work which uh, looks at the modeling of, of, uh, 
of nutrition choice in, in New Zealand and nutrition choice in the US from a um, from a, a cost perspective, we want to build in a lot more uh, into, into the work we're doing and essentially create an online line tool like we have with the Delta model, which I'll talk about shortly. Then we've got the middle area, which is probably the most complex, which is if you're a country or a region, the EU, for example, what food should we produce? What food should we produce to provide a contribution to nutrition security? What food should we produce for other reasons? Um, livelihoods, um, rural prosperity, land use optimization, etc. And then the final model, which is where I'll focus today, is what does everybody need on the planet? And the good thing about this model is it's somewhat easier. There is only the one planet. I did watch a film on, on the, um, the way over that apparently the moon is hollow and they're growing potatoes inside it. No joke. In fact, that's where potatoes came from in South America. No, no doubt there are people that believe that. Um, but this, this model basically is, is around what are the consequences of the, of the global food production system on the big picture? The nutrients needed by the global population, and I think we've done some interesting things in the way that we look at that, and the consequences of, of those changes. Um, and that nutrition for all in that definition of the uh, I showed earlier means that there's enough energy, enough calories, there's enough macronutrients, and the micronutrients and trace elements. It's not one or the other. You cannot distill the global food system to carbon emissions and protein, et cetera. And it's actually complicated to try and combine these things in indices. And the FAO has just completed some work that tried, and the conclusions which you could have predicted say, actually, there's a range of challenges in doing so. And so what we try and do is not necessarily say, from our modeling, the answer is, but the insights are, right? All models are wrong. Some of them are useful, and we hope our modeling is useful. And here is another uh, short clip that explains our Delta model, and this is my colleague Lorette. A challenge we face is our ability to sustainably nourish an increasing global population without exceeding the capacity of the planet. There are many different ways of approaching this challenge and many suggestions for what the answer may be. The Sustainable Nutrition Initiative, or SNI, developed the Delta model to generate informed discussion about food system sustainability. The model helps people explore changes to the food system themselves by changing components of the system and viewing the impact on the supply of nutrients. The model uses global food system data from international agencies and research to predict the nutrition available to the global citizen both now and in future scenarios. The user can adjust the production of different food groups the degree of food waste and the global population to see the impact of these changes on human nutrition. The model also calculates some of the other non-nutritional impacts of these changes, such as the amount of cropland required. The model has featured in multiple publications in scientific journals and has hundreds of users around the world. The SNI team has made the model openly accessible on our website so that anyone can have the chance to explore the global food system. This allows everyone to see the importance of considering nutrition when thinking about food system sustainability. Just talk a bit more about what plant-based and animal optimised is. Um, I won't go through these publications because please do go on the website. They're all freely accessible through the website. Uh, these are just the publications um, relating to particularly the Delta model. Um, just a very high level overview of what the model does. It essentially takes all the food produced 
And when I say produce, this is everything that leaves the world's farms and oceans. So we're not at, the, we're not at this point adjusting for um, losses pre-farm gate or, or in, in, in catch, et cetera. It's, it's, it's what's lost after that food leaves the world's farms and oceans. Um, now, I often given a, asked the question around the accuracy of this. Look, it's as good as we can get from the available data. We know that there are some challenges with that data. And we're the first to uh, admit, and it's, it's clearly available on our website, there are limitations. And I don't, again, suggest that this is a, a recommendation that the answer is. It's about providing context. What we then do is we take that food and we and we take the those food commodities and we take it to the amount of food that's available. There's waste and supply chain losses. You can actually adjust both in the model, the supply chain and the uh, consumer waste separately and look at the impact of that. There's non-food uses. Okay, uh, example there would be there's a lot of, for example, palm oil used in, in soaps and the like, quite a significant tonnage. And then there's the amount used in feed, and I'll come back to, to that as well. So that gives you the food available. We then take that and convert that into the nutrients available using the USDA food composition data set. Um, we've got uh, just completed a project at Monash, which has looked at what the variability of, of that might be on a, on a global basis. And, um, and then we get into that really important area that Connie was talking about, bioavailable. Because if it's not bioavailable, you might as well be eating sawdust, right? So, um, and it's quite limited. Surprisingly, given the importance of what I'm going to show you in terms of what nutrients we're challenged with, we don't have good enough bioavailability data and certainly not good enough to make sweeping statements around some of the changes that you would uh, propose to the global food system. Now, we adjust this to the demographically weighted requirements of the population. And I won't go through the details because I think Connie showed that very nicely in one of her slides that the, the needs are different. And what most models do is assume that the global population is an average male, which is not true. And it changes year by year as populations change around the world in terms of um, essentially we're getting a bit of an hourglass, more of an hourglass shape to our populations as the years go by with an aging and an increasing younger population, but not in the same parts of the world, quite frankly. So, that, so we adjust year on year the projected changes to demographics, again available from the UN, with those with those needs. And at a high level, I'll just go through the biomass flows. The food system is already plant-based. Eighty-seven percent of what's produced is plant-based material. Thirteen percent is animal. 170 million tonnes of the plant goes back into producing more plants, seeds. About 130 million tonnes goes into animal feed, fish meal, calf milk replacer, those types of things. We then have one point, about 15% of the plant material goes to feed animals. Not 80, not some of the extreme numbers, about 15%, which is still a substantial amount of the human edible nutrition that could go into humans goes to animals. That means if food supply is roughly 75, 20, uh, 77, 23, by the point of consumption globally, so this is everybody on the planet, 75% of what we consume is from plants, 25% from animals. But look at the efficiency of the two sides of the plant animal. This is about 80% of what's produced in animals is consumed and, and uh, considerably less in the plant side. One of the reasons for that is that 91% of all food waste comes from plants globally. This is not production losses as well. This is just post-production. Now, 130 million tons of animal food waste is not trivial either. Let's, let's face it, that's a lot of waste. But you can, the scenarios you can generate in Delta let you examine the consequences of changing that waste along with changing different food commodities. What difference does it make to the food system? And so what you see here are the 29 nutrients we have in our model. So not just protein, not just calories, 29. 
And the important point is we've got protein, but we've also got the essential amino acids as, of individu as individual nutrients, because you need both. You need protein, but you also need those, those amino acids we can't synthesize. And this is really important. And there are more nutrients than 29, quite frankly. At the moment, these are the ones that we can confidently model across all food commodities. We're, as we speak, we're gaining some insights to add additional ones. For example, iodine, which is particularly important. Um, just point out the, uh, the fifth column from the left there and the calcium, um, coming back to Connie's point. We are short of calcium globally, I'll go through that. About 50% of the calcium comes from uh, dairy, that's that cream colour in the middle, and a significant amount from plants. Looking at the nutrient distribution, and this is the point, right? Well, this is why we've got 800 million people with uh, energy and protein malnutrition in the world, whereas um, we actually produce enough energy and enough protein to feed everybody. However, we don't produce enough calcium or vitamin E in the entirety of all the food that we produce globally to meet the population requirements. And we're right on the margin with a range of other micronutrients, as you can see there. But of course, on a country level, there's huge variability, which is shown there with the ranges. And of course, within countries, you've got the haves and the have-nots as well. So there's a so as I'll come to protein, which I think is is being rather misleading in the way that that's been played globally. There are issues, but they're not issues around producing more protein necessarily. And just to show that and give you an example of what we mean by delta, delta allows you to look at side-by-side -side scenarios or the changes, the deltas between different scenarios. And you can look at all 29 nutrients in one view. You can look at what it means in terms of a variety of other characteristics of the food system. But I'm gonna keep it fairly simple for this presentation. So there's the amount of energy and uh, protein that was produced in 2018. That was when we started our Delta model development. And this is what you have by 2030 when it's spread across the population. So the, the solid bar there is, is the target intake for the demographically weighted population, which is why you see it at 40 something grams per person and not 57, which is the average for an average male. Not everybody in the world is an average male, right? And these make a huge difference when you're talking about seven to eight billion people, these, these, these differences. And I'll come back to that. So, so we actually have enough energy and protein. But we don't have enough calcium today. We don't have enough vitamin E. And some other micronutrient deficiencies will certainly appear unless we produce enough of the right foods. And that's enough of the right animal source foods and enough of the right plant source foods. It's not just simply a case of plant-based, right? Changing your changing plant meat burgers to plant-based burgers, quite frankly, is not necessarily the solution. Um, back to protein. It is a demand issue, not a supply issue. Protein demand is going through the roof. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on this because I wrote an article which uh, I did a presentation at COP last year. If you go to the World Climate Foundation website, uh, my name, look at an article called Need or Greed. It explains uh, the protein picture and what's happening there and what that means around overall nutrition. But the key point is we actually produced enough protein or did in 2018 to meet the population or the projected population requirements when it peaks in 2050. It's about affordability, it's about access, and quite frankly, it's about protein quality. But even, even with protein quality, lysine is our most limited amino acid in our modeling work, and we've got enough of that as well. So it's not so much the protein itself, it's what comes with that protein that's important if you're looking at balance. So what comes with that protein in the different foods in meeting all of those other nutrient requirements? Um, waste, there's another thing that's often proposed as a big part of the solution. Well, it actually is and it isn't. So it's certainly we've got the energy, we've got the waste, and in fact, you know, um, by 2050, as I mentioned, you've got plenty of protein. You eliminate waste, we've got plenty of protein. Uh, 
And although waste does close things like the calcium flat gap, it doesn't eliminate them. And this is why it's so important that we understand bioavailability. If we're going to close this gap, let's make sure it's bioavailable. bioavailable. That's going to come down to portions. It's going to come down, well, foods, portions, meals, diets. It's not going to be simply a case of this food or that food. Um, and that calcium situation is just going to get worse. So we, contrary to protein, by 2050, we'll have a huge gap. Just looking at that nutrient waste and, and turning the biomass flows, that one point one and a quarter billion tons of biomass waste that you saw in the in the um, earlier um, figure I showed to waste on an internet, individual nutrient point of view, and why we can't solve the calcium issue through removal of waste, we don't waste a lot of those things that provide us with the calcium. So 50% comes from milk. We waste relatively little of it compared to some other food sources. So you've got to build that in. Now, um, waste is often proposed as part of the solution. We need to crack both why we are having so much supply chain waste and why we're having so much in-home waste. It's roughly 50-50. So that, that, that one and a third billion tons of food waste, about half of it's coming through the supply chain, particularly in the plant-based side and about uh, half through in home. Um, I just want to recognise uh, my colleagues, and particularly Andrew Fletcher and Nick Smith. These are the brainy boxes, if you want, behind the, um, the programming and algorithm development, which is uh, hugely complex. Um, one thing we did with the, when we developed this model is we worked with KPMG to do this. Why did we work with KPMG? Because we wanted these algorithms to be auditable. So there's not some sneaky little um, mathematical way in which certain things distort the picture. So uh, KPMG were involved in that particular process. And we've got lots of students and uh, PhDs, masters, postdocs working with us in New Zealand. Uh, Reddit Institute is actually the peak uh, research institute in New Zealand that involves all of the New Zealand universities and all of the government research departments involved in food research. So there's about 6,000 or 7,000 staff in total that are um, available um, to at least, least available to work should they wish to in, in the program. And then we've got our global uh, network and, and particularly um, pleased that we've got uh, Connie as part of this. And I just noticed that that was the error that my colleague did in terms of the assignment of where you're located. So um, apologies for that, Connie. The um, like, like to, again to emphasize, this is about insights. It is about understanding what's possible, what might look like it's practical with a name to try and, and develop what might be more optimal. But it's not a, it's not a model that gives you the answer is go plug and play. It really is a tool to let you look at uh, the food system and gain a better understanding, which is our philosophy. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Connie and, and Jeremy. Um, that changeover took me a little by surprise, so I didn't get a chance to introduce you, Jeremy, I'm sorry, but you introduced yourself as the man without a change of clothes. So, uh, so I think if you if you don't mind staying up, and Connie, maybe you could join, and we can have a few minutes for for questions. Any questions? I've got one for you, Connie. So you made a statement which is biologically we're all the same, and uh, I'll give you a few seconds to justify that statement. <laughs> because I think there'll be some people following on who are gonna try and convince us that biologically we're not all the same. Well, that is the argument being put forward by the people who are promoting harmonized average requirements, that it's like a continuum. And um, so you might have adjustments due to size or status or whatever, but the biological response should be 
similar across nations, but where the difference will occur is in food supply, and that's largely bioavailability. Okay, okay. So, can I add yeah. To that? yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, absolutely, right? We know that our genome's different. We know that our microbiome's yeah. somewhat different, right? We know that's real. We don't understand the full complexity yet. So, um, I will be the first to admit we haven't modeled that aspect uh, in, in, in the DELS model. Nick Smith, one of those guys who uh, is a, one of the who builds the algorithms, he did his PhD in microbiome modeling and mathematical modeling of that. So we understand it. The reason we haven't included it is we can't do that with our models with the same degree of confidence. Right. So we know then they're, they're wrong, but we think they're useful. So I think that we've just got to be careful that we can make progress with what we recognize is still um, far from perfect, if you want, and we don't sort of wait for the perfect picture because we might be waiting too long. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, Jeff, wait for the microphone, Jeff, if you don't mind. I, I know I know it's hard for you, but you, you must. Okay, go. I'm very relaxed. Um, fantastic presentation. I have a question for you, Jeremy. Um, uh, great uh, to hear about this model. You're using FAO Food Balance Sheet uh, data. So, um, uh, ILSI Research Foundation a few years ago published uh, metrics, a study on metrics for sustainable food systems. Um, we're supporting a researcher in, in uh, Philippines at the moment who's looking at some options uh, to substitute locally generated data. And I'm wondering if, if the Delta modeling program has the ability to look at, um, at um, different scenarios or different databases uh, and sort of compare the, the results? Um, so, so essentially the algorithms can run off any data sets, right? Um, so we could plug in uh, different data sets, uh, should they become available, should they um, be complementary to what we're doing? I mean, that's the key thing about the, the model is it allows you to turn off things or bring in uh, new data. Um, becomes particularly important though when you're looking at those national or regional models and actually the more bespoke the data rather than global averages the better so if you've got better data for a particular country or a particular region then you should use that and that's what we're intending to do great that's helpful uh, sorry can i follow up with one, one other quick question um there's been some recent work um coming out of india uh, stressing the importance of regional differences so a country like india of course huge and you can find different situations different parts of the country a country like Philippines or Indonesia, probably the same, uh, again, very different, different parts of the country. Um, is, is there a potential to uh, break it down into uh, smaller than country units? Uh, so, uh, yes. And, and, and so the, the national model actually is a, is a composite of regional models because we don't produce food or we don't necessarily consume the same diets, particular size of the region. Um, as I said, that middle model is probably the most complex because of all of these things. Um, what we have done, and I didn't cover, is, is, is in that national model, what we've already modeled is all of the nutrition flows that occur. So production within a country, how much leaves, what comes in, and what does that mean for the average nutrition status within a particular country? Country, We've got that at a continental level, so you, you could go world, you could go Africa, you can go Rwanda and get that result. And, and Jeremy, I got the impression people can use this at the individual level as well. Is that? No, we, we are going to. So uh, we are developing a model which um, is, is going to be more about individual dietary choice. Uh, much more complicated because if you look at if you look at what we've done with the the Delta model, essentially we're taking the food commodities. We can be agnostic about what those commodities are turned into in terms of food because you don't create more vitamin C or, or protein depending on what food you put it in. However, from an individual point of view, it becomes very, very important what foods you choose and particularly processed food and, and, and the sources and fortification and so on and so forth. So that is uh, quite a complex model.